My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading will be John and Santa, the Cowboy Shirt, Video 6, The Reindeer Teeth. So here is the novella, John and Santa, the Cowboy Shirt, the novella by John Passfield. That's me in a cowboy shirt when I was in elementary school, but not the cowboy shirt that's mentioned in the title. That's the mystery that John hopes Santa will solve. As writer John Passfield is driving home from a December book discussion meeting and thinking about the Christmas topics that were discussed, in particular Dickens, who wrote a novella that transformed the world's uh, conception of Christmas, he suddenly finds himself sitting in a sleigh, pulled by Rudolph and eight tiny reindeer. What an excellent opportunity to ask Santa about a 70-year-old uh, puzzle, The Mystery of the Missing Cowboy Shirt. Well, that's a topic for a video, and it's certainly a major topic in the novella, but this is the reindeer teeth story that we're doing now. So, there's one segment of the story of the reindeer teeth in each of the ten chapters of the novella, so the story forms one layer of pebbles in an idea mosaic in the mind of the main character, me, John, as he travels with Santa, Rudolph, and the eight tiny reindeer in the sleigh. So, let's go to page 10 for the first installment of The Reindeer Teeth. Page 10. It had been a difficult evening. Oh, it was fun until it was time to go to bed. Only a few things left to do on Christmas Eve. So, from 10 to 16, so six pages apart for the segments of this story because they, they compare and contrast these images with other images of other stories. They had gone out to a Christmas tree farm. The day was clear and cold. Their four-year-old son had chosen a tree and they had approved. Then we go to page 24. A few more trimmings for the tree. It was in the living room. Some decorations from the past and some brand new. Christmas Eve was relaxing and cheerful. All the presents were wrapped and hid. They would bring them out when the kids were safely in bed. As I mentioned, only two boys at that time. Okay, from 24 we go to 32. They had a fireplace in their home. No fire on Christmas Eve. Clean the ashes out so Santa can come right down. Their oldest son was four. He asked a lot of questions, other things he knew and would gladly tell. Then we go to page 42. The younger boy was just a baby. He didn't have any questions to ask. Everything about Christmas was fine with him. Last-minute preparations for Santa. Their four-year-old knew exactly what to set out. Amazing that he knew what Santa and Rudolph would need. From 42 to 50. A glass of milk for Santa and a carrot for Rudolph, right here on the kitchen table. Well, it had been a difficult evening whether to drink the glass of milk, whether to bite the carrot, or not. Either way, he was in the position of offering truth. And then we go to page uh, 59. Early to rise and down to the kitchen, four-year-old fingers tickling his feet. I wonder if he did. There was the proof. The hair stood on end. The glass of milk had all been swallowed. The carrot had been chewed by reindeer teeth. Santa and Rudolph had come to visit as sure as sure. The power that adults have over children the malleability of a young child's mind, the responsibility of being an adult in what is essentially a child's world. He felt odd all Christmas day, 
The presents were open. The two boys played with their brand new toys. Okay, then on to page 69. Afternoon and the house was crowded. 30 adults and kids. Color slides of the days when the adults were kids with new toys. Presents and wrappings all over the floor. Laughing and sipping and chatting and singing along with the carols on TV. Turkey with gravy and everyone seated and bowing their heads. And then, um, page 87. No, sorry, 78. Almost missed one there. He felt odd all Christmas day. Glass of wine to end the evening. He tucked the two boys into their beds. And now the final episode of this little story of the reindeer teeth. The younger boy was just a baby. He didn't have any question to ask. Everything about Christmas was fine with him. So the younger boy was happy, he was just a baby. The older boy was happy, he'd seen the proof that there was Santa and there was a Rudolph. But the father, well, he's not so sure anymore. Yeah, offering proof, eh, or denying proof? Boy, what a dilemma. There's no in-between in that case. My wife and I were in our mid-twenties when we bought a house in Ancaster, Ontario, Canada. We were in our late twenties and early thirties when we had our three young boys. But there were only two boys at the time of this story. Our oldest son, Blake, would have been about four years old when he decided that we should not have a fire in the fireplace on Christmas Eve because Santa would need to be able to come down the chimney to deliver the presents. So we went along with his request. And then he said that Santa likes a glass of milk and that Rudolph likes to chew on a carrot. So I set out a glass of milk and a carrot on a plate in the kitchen table just before we put our two little boys to bed. Well, here I was, about 32 years old, and I'd never had any problem keeping a very clear mind about the dividing line between reality and fantasy. But this was a very upsetting evening for me. I had two very clear choices. I could either leave the glass of milk and the carrot as they were for our little boy, our four-year-old, to find untouched on the kitchen table the next morning, or I could drink a good part of the glass of milk and I could chew on the carrot and leave those two items for our little boy to find on the kitchen table the next morning. In either case, I would be providing proof. Proof that Santa and Rudolph had been in our house in our kitchen, or proof that they had not. So what to do? Well, as the story says, I drank the milk and I chewed on the carrot, but, I was amazed at how real these artifacts were to our son when he saw them the very next day. He told me as we were coming down the stairs in the bedroom that he wondered if Santa would come on Christmas Eve. And the first and the only thing he said when he saw these items on the kitchen table was, he did. So, that is the way I wrote the story. There's really not much I can add except to say that I think this story, as well as being a family anecdote from my own life and times, is an illustration of the power of myth. We not only create myths, but we also create the facts that support our own myths and deny other people's myths. If you want an explanation of the dynamics of human interaction, of love and hate, of peace and of war, between individual humans and between groups of humans, look no further than the dynamics of the human creation, maintenance, destruction, and replacement of myth. Once again, this is my novella. It's uh, John and Santa, the cowboy shirt, 
a novel novella rather by John Passfield. It's found on Amazon where there's more information. Rocks Mills Press is my publisher. Rocks Mills Press, R O C K S M I L L S P R E S S S P R E S S two S's dot com has more information. John Passfield.ca, my website has two books. Just click on the icon, you can read the books. Um, one is a planning notebook where I plan and write the novella. One is a journal where I reflect on all these topics, myth especially, but novellas, Santa, um, Christmas, and so on. That's johnpassfield.ca. Lastly, I'll say thank you for watching this video.